Hello and welcome to the programme. Today we're going to talk about the judging process within the club and how to prepare your car for judging. With me in the studio today we have Peter Nielsen, a team captain and a long time judge and Paul Geyer, a new member who's interested in getting his car ready for judging. Welcome gentlemen. Thank you Ralph. Thanks Ralph for inviting us. I thought we'd start off by talking about the judging process a little bit and uh, getting into some of your questions. Do you want to talk in general terms about why we do judging? What, what, what the real purpose of uh, a judging program is? Well certainly I, I do this when we, we have our seminars and uh, our judging seminars and the purpose of judging is to improve the car, to help the member mm -hmm. improve his car. When you go to an annual meet you'll find out that most people go they register at the hotel, they put their bags in the room, and the first thing they want to do is to go and look at the cars. The most important thing to people that go to annual meets generally is to see the cars. Whether they're going to take a car for judging or not, that's what they're there for. They want to see the different cars, all the models, you know, the good cars, and compare their cars, so it's the cars. And that's what, what the club really is about, is preserving the cars, making them right, and keeping them around for generations to come. So judging, plays a big part of this. Uh, we, we have a friend of mine who has his car judged and he said the only reason that he has the car judged is to make sure everything works. He said it gives him an opportunity to see that the car, everything on the car is working and he feels that it's, it's the thing that makes him, you know, make everything work. Otherwise he said, oh, if a cigarette lighter doesn't work or, or the heater doesn't work, well, I don't drive in the winter. But he said, if I put it in for judging, I know somebody's going to come and check on me and make sure it works and I think that's a good good understanding of the car I mean it, it makes you keep that car in good shape for, for generations to come and I think that the judging does that very well it, it also you know it, there's a level of competition and competition is good I think it should be good friendly competition I don't think anybody should get hot under the collar or upset about it but if we can go out there and compare notes and cars and, and experiences, I think it, it is a good thing for the club. Do you think people should be afraid to take their car on the field if they're not having it judged? Well, no. I, 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 yeah. This is a, a celebration of the yeah. cars. Judging Day is a celebration of the cars. We need to get as many cars out there so that people can look at them, look at them on a nice, bright, sunny day and get an opportunity to compare what they've got with somebody else. There's a camaraderie. People sit behind their cars have a good time and I think everybody should try and get their cars on the field. I'd like to know, Ralph, uh, with my car, how it would compete against all those other high-priced cars in, in, in the meet. Well, if your car's in, in good shape and everything works, it stands as good a chance as, as anything else. We have the two two uh, different categories of judging. We have the touring and we have the concourse. So if you pick the right category for the type of car that you've got, you'll do very well. So my car would go into touring class, then, right? Well, if your car's, everything works and you use your car a fair amount and uh, the, the car is generally in good shape, yes, it'll do well in touring. If, if you wanted to bring it up to a notch and, and do some of the finishes and that kind of thing, that, then, of course, you could consider the, the concourse level. What would I have to do to prepare to, uh, for the event? Uh, what do I have to do at home and what do I have to do during the event when I have my car there? Well, the first thing you, I would suggest you do is get a copy of the judging form, which is available from headquarters, and go through every box that's on there and check it out on your car and see that everything works and everything that the judges are going to check works and is, is up to the level that they would expect it to be and the judging form is your best friend for that. We have, uh, have some here. This is um, the score sheet for your car. Um, the class is 114. We start classes 101 through 116 at the moment. Mm -hmm and uh, we have a different sheet for each one with a very similar amount of lines. That is, what we try to do is to break the car up into areas. We have two forms for the engine because we take that as the largest part of the car 
and use that as our biggest determining factor. That's the greatest number of points I use for the engine. So we have sheet one and two for the engine. And then the rest of the car is covered on the other four sheets. So that the underside and the subframes on your car is one complete sheet that has a similar number of lines and points to a silver cloud. That brings into the senior awards so that the cars are being judged very similarly. Um, and that keeps consistency. We're always trying to be consistent throughout the classes as well as within the classes. And that's what we're trying to do is to make the judging as fair as possible. Because different uh, years of cars are competing for the same award in the senior area, yeah. we're trying to keep the thing as, um, as fair as possible. So we have an underside and subframes and then trunk and standing height uh, this is for the um, trunk area, the tools, the tyres, and those areas. So we've, we've broken down the car even more. And uh, the body and the bright work is another sheet. And then we have the interior. So over that, we have taken all the areas of the car and we've broken it down to keep it similar throughout the classes. And uh, we find that this is the fairest way to, to be and to be consistent. This also gives us the opportunity to have one judge do one sheet, and he does the one area of the car all the way through the class. So we have a sheet that one person on the team, or actually two people, we have a writer and somebody that does, does the checking of each item. And, and in a perfect team, we would have 12 members, and in the large classes we do this. In some of the classes that are small and don't have so many cars, we might cut back and only have one person for each sheet. But um, he then goes through and is consistent all the way through. All the time he goes through, he checks the same thing on the car, on each car, the same item on each car, so that it, we get the consistency. And that's, that's the way we judge the cars. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what that means, uh, Paul, when your car is being judged on the field, uh, you're going to be approached by a team of people. The team captain will probably introduce himself. Uh, the team captain's probably not actually judging the car. His team is doing that. They'll parcel out the score sheets and do their job. In, in some of the larger classes, it may be that the um, judges are actually spread out a little bit and the, uh, the guy doing the underside of your car will be three cars down and on his way. So as an owner, you're going to have to stay with the car until all of the judges have, have finished doing their job, and they'll let you know when, uh, when it's time for the car to be released. The team captain will do that, eh? Yeah, exactly. And most of your communication will be with the team captain in order to keep matters uh, relatively organized. Um, but th those score sheets are extremely useful, and, and if you're looking for uh, a preparation guide for the car, they're very detailed. They're point by point, item by item. If I could just make one comment on preparation. I think a lot of people are intimidated by the beautiful appearance of a lot of the other cars maybe they've seen at national meets, but if you do get that score sheet, you'll see that a lot of the points relate to mechanical items, relate to things under the hood and under the car. And uh, just because you've seen a lot of really beautiful cars doesn't mean you don't have a car that's very competitive, especially if you take the time to go through ahead of time and run through the score sheet and deal with the, any small items that need correction, any one of which could lose you a point, you, you can probably do very well. We're not so much into finish and spit and polish as we are that everything works and that the car is the way it left the factory. And it's far more important to us that the car drives well and does all of the other things well than it looking just a uh, beauty, a trailer queen or something okay, like that. Okay, that's, that's good yeah. uh, response. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, that, that's absolutely true because I think a lot of people are preoccupied with appearance issues and appearance is important and authenticity is important and cleanliness are important but uh, you can still go in with a few paint chips and do very well if your car is absolutely mechanically Mechanical. correct and operating correctly. If, if you look at the form and you'll see that the way that the form and the deductions are set up it's, it's much fairer it, because it does cover all the areas of the car and it is only if, if you're thinking in a hundred point terms, which most people do, it is merely a quarter point. It isn't a drastic thing. It, the, the going to a show, having your car judged, is a good way of learning about your car and understanding what it needs.
maybe another thing we should talk about a bit, Ralph, is, is what do you think owners should do? Assume they've made it to the meet, the car is, is well prepared for the meet. How do they prepare themselves for judging day itself? Any guidance on that? Well, there, there, is, there are some very important things. Certainly, if we take the, the last things first, once you get onto the judging field, it's very important to clean the car out. A team of judges are going to come to your car, they're going to check over your car, and they need to be able to get in and out of that car fairly efficiently. They're not going to be very too fast, but they want to be efficiently, so you don't need to have your picnic hamper in the trunk because they're going to want to look at the battery and the tools. So it's good to clear your car out, put everything behind the car, and make sure the inside of the car is accessible to them. Now the judges won't climb all in your car or all over your car, but they still need to be able to lean in and look at your car. Another important thing is to be there so that you can help them. The judges are not allowed to open the doors, they're not allowed to switch anything on or touch your car really in any way. Uh, we have strict instructions that the owner must do everything. That is, must show the tools, must take the floor mat up in the trunk, take the rubber bung out. I'm talking about your car now in the shadows. So they take the rubber bung out to check the spare wheel and they want you to uncover the battery. So you are responsible to make sure that you know how everything works and to uh, be able to make it work for the, to show them that it does indeed work. Um, and, and on that, I mean, I as a judge often notice that owners get a bit nervous. Um, all of a sudden there's a team of five or six people around and they're doing a lot of things at once and the owners being asked to open doors, shut doors, open the hood or the bonnet rather, uh, start the engine, stop the engine and so on. So you can just stay calm and maybe make it easier for yourself by doing some things ahead of time. If, you, if you've got a cloud and the batteries uh, you know, under the trunk in the basement and you need to sp take some time to expose it, do that before the judges get there. It's one less thing to worry about while you're there. Uh, if you've got an old small horsepower car and you've never used the magneto in th three years, maybe try it out before judging day just to make sure you know how to do it. Make that kind of thing easier for yourself and uh, it'll go a lot more smoothly. In, in a class, in a, an average size class, what will happen is the team will come up to your car, the uh, team captain will introduce himself to you and the team, he'll, he'll introduce him, and he'll, he'll direct you. He'll say, you, you know, he'll get his team members, one person will be in front of the car, one person will be behind the car, so that everything that's done will only need to be done once because we're going to check the lights, we're going to check how the car starts, we're going to check all of those things. So that if you can follow his direction and listen yeah, to what uh, he says to you, it, it'll go very smoothly. Uh, there'll be somebody leaning in the car to watch the instruments to make sure those work. As I say, They'll get you to start the car, they'll get you to turn the lights on, press the brake lights, and once the car is turned off, they'll get you to check the reverse lights so that the car's not running and not liable to run over anybody. So we take a great deal of care so that nobody gets hurt and no, there's no, no difficulty. So it, uh, do you find that works very well? I think so, usually. Um, it's always a, there's a lot of frantic activity going on, and, uh, but from the owner's standpoint, um, if they can just be there and be helpful, the team captain will try to make it as you know, comfortable an experience for the owner as, as he can. And uh, the owner, I think, has, if, if they're well prepared, shouldn't find it uh, particularly difficult. Ralph, could you explain to me what I'd have to do to my car to get it to the Concorde level? Um, in the Concorde level, the car is much more like it left the showroom. In fact, it is as it left the showroom. The paint underneath the hood would have to be in good, good condition. The uh, cadmium plating that they used on the nuts and bolts and some of the linkage, that would all need to be bright and shiny. Um, all of the uh, heaters and wiper motors and everything would need to be as they, they were when they left the factory. On the touring level, we, we're much more open. We allow are different in parts and that kind of thing, but on the Concorde level, we're looking for much more originality. So to do that, you need to get a car that's in really first-class condition and bring it back to that level. And uh, it, it's far more competitive because of the way that they look at the car in that, in that area. So a car that's driven normally, uh, a car that would be driven a fair amount, couldn't go into that level. It would have to be... 
Well, no, that, that's not true. We, we have members who do keep their car up to that level, but still drive them long distances. Well, be quiet now. Listen, listen, Doug, how many miles on the car? About 380,000. About 380,000. So Perhaps uh, we should talk now a, a bit, Ralph, too, about the, uh, the senior level of competition, because a lot of people looking at whether they should enter their car see, uh, see all the wonderful cars at a national meet, but many of them are competing at the senior level because they've won a class award already, and that means they're ineligible for a period of time in class awards, but they'll be competing at the senior level. So obviously the level of that competition is, is, is even higher than, than Concours, but it also opens up some of the space in the, uh, in the class competitions. And certainly there are classes where there are not enough cars entering sometimes to, to uh, fill all the awards. And uh, I think the club would be very happy if, if we had more people entering some of the classes. I know I judge in a, a pre-war class and, and we'd love to have more cars show up each year. Um, and certainly if you've got a very good car, you've, you've got a very good chance of winning something if you do come. That's very true. Um, some of the areas are, are quite uh, poorly attended yes. almost. The, uh, the small horsepower and the um, pre-war cars generally could always do with more cars. Um, we, we touched upon senior things. When, when, a, when a really good car wins a, a concourse uh, class award, it's not eligible for three years and it's going to go up into the senior which opens up a space for somebody else and uh, when that car's going through the senior process it's chances are that that car's going to be out of class competition for more than five years before it comes back in if it is a, a high point car so there's always there's always <coughs> an opportunity for somebody else to come along and uh, get involved um, yeah, and, and part of the philosophy here is that the club really wants people to to come with their cars and uh, we encourage members to to come and if they should uh, look at some of those classes and bring, the, bring their cars. Um. We, we spoke about some senior awards and if you are lucky enough to win the class and then you'll go on to the senior, we have a certain hierarchy of different awards as, as you go through. Um, once you've won the class award, you're kind of put into a pot with all of the classes. What happens is once you've won the class in 114, which would be your car, a Silver Shadow, you will then enter for the Rolls-Royce of Canada, uh, the Trophy Award, and the uh, Senior Awards. And if, uh, if you're in Concours, I'm talking about now, if you're in uh, touring, you'll go for the Rolls-Royce of America and then on for the, the Edgar Eatner Award. And these are Senior Awards. And what, what happens is the cars are then uh, checked by the class judges, they go through, check your car to make sure it's still at the level it was when it won the class award, and then a driving team will take over and drive in your car with you. It's made up of three people so that the four of you go out and they check different things on your car, make sure the temperature gauge is working, the speedo's working, there's no rattles, how well the car drives. And what we do with this is it gives us a consistency of how good the car really is. We've given the class judges an opportunity to make sure for leaks and how the doors close and all of those things the instruments working but not in a running condition we haven't seen how high the temperature gauge goes how low the oil pressure is you know all of those things so that then the senior team gets to just to run the car for about a five five to seven minute check and then you have an opportunity to win one of these other awards and these are very prestigious within the club these are high level awards that uh, a lot of cars from those classes, even pre-war and post-war, are running for the uh, Rolls-Royce of Canada award, and the trophy award is for post-war cars, and then the Rolls-Royce of England award is for pre-war cars. So that there is an opportunity to go on and to really find out how good your car is. So you, we cover a lot, of, a lot of area, and we feel that we do a, a tremendous job by being able to tell our membership how good their cars are, by, by the way we judge them. Many members think, well, they'd like to bring their car, but they're, they're really not sure how well it will do, and they're not sure they're ready. Uh, they have the opportunity of entering their car for evaluation and having uh, 
the judges uh, in a particular class take a look at it during the, w the week of the meet, not, not on the judging field itself. And if you want a, a really good opportunity to have your car looked at by, by people who, who can give you some good advice, they'll run you through the score sheets, tell you uh, how you would do if you were actually having it judged, and give you whatever advice they can on, on what you should do to bring it along. I think that's something not enough people take advantage of. More people should do it. So that's part of the evaluation process and not yeah. judging, right? That, it's, it's outside the that's judging great. process. Uh, if you're coming to the meet, you can enter your car for evaluation. If you have it evaluated, you, you can't have it judged. But if you've never had the car judged and you don't particularly want to do it that year, but you'd really like to see what you need to do, it's an excellent, uh, excellent way of finding out. More people should do it. I think it's a very good member ben benefit that not enough people take advantage of. Um, I, I'm one of those people that believes that you should put your car in for judging, even though you might not feel it's up to that level. But mm -hmm. if, if you're unsure, and there's a certain amount of competitiveness within this program, and I don't think that competitiveness is a bad thing, but if you're, if you're not one that wants to be involved in it, then the evaluation is certainly a good service. We generally do this on the Friday before judging day, and as Peter said, you can't enter your car for judging if you have it evaluated. Could you have it evaluated in different classes or is it just... No, it, it's generally an evaluation. The, Overall. The, the judging teams are put together on the Friday and this is why we do it. On the Friday the judging teams put together and then the team captain takes his team to look at the cars that need to be evaluated which gives them a familiarization of the cars and also gives that member a good service. It's a, a really good member benefit. You often find when you're judging cars that some some people would really like to take the judge aside and ask what what should I do about this or right. you know is is this correct and so on and unfortunately the way the judging works there really isn't time for that and it's almost inappropriate for the judges to spend too much time talking to a particular owner about their car it looks as if they're paying too much attention to one person over another that's for evaluation if that's one of the reasons you're bringing your car definitely enter it for evaluation that, uh, that's very true. Um, we, in the judging process, in the large classes, there is no time to uh, spend, you know, giving people advice. In fact, we don't want the judges to really talk to the members who are showing their cars because of difficulties. Um, a judge might say the wrong thing or offend offend the owner. So the the judges may seem a little cold on judging day but they're, they're not. They've been instructed not to get into conversation with the owner, not to confuse him, and just to judge the car. So if you, felt, you, know, if you feel that the judges are a bit cold, it's because they've been told to do it, and it's so that we don't have a problem on the judging field. So certainly, if you, if you want to get advice, the best thing to do is to um, have, it evaluated. have it evaluated. I'm not saying that after the judging is over and it's all finished that the, the judges won't sit down with you and say well we noticed this and we noticed that quite often they, they will do that but obviously they're not going to give you your score they're not going to tell you what the points are because we, we don't need any arguments we don't pe want people saying well I know that's right and you're wrong and that kind of thing so we, we like to keep it a nice and clean and, and it will seem that we're a little cold but we really aren't it's for the best interest of the club generally <laughs>
proper uh, manner uh, appropriate for a Rolls Royce car. Is that Cer correct? Certainly, yeah. the same thing yeah. applies. Yeah. Where you know we want you to feel comfortable with mm -hmm. your car, and that's a safety item. There's yeah. no deduction mm -hmm. for indicators yeah. and seat belts and those mm -hmm. kinds of safety items. Uh, high highlights, you know, in the rear window, those kinds mm -hmm. of things. We don't deduct for no. Yeah, yeah. I guess the qualification being it, it's always expected the owner will do the job in a in a proper manner appropriate uh, for that car. I, if you if you grab something at a at the local uh, auto parts shop which isn't appropriate at all and wire it in as a set of taillights for example that's probably going to lose you points. Certainly. Yeah. And uh, yes that would that would be a deduction if it yeah. if it wasn't in that workmanlike manner. Okay. And say how about something like air conditioning? Um, because a lot of owners find that, uh, especially in the warmer climates, they, they, they're uncomfortable driving their car and they would be considering putting air conditioning in, say, an early cloud that uh, wasn't supplied with it originally. Again, it's a workmanlike yeah. thing. Again, we want the cars yeah. to be used. We want the owners mm -hmm. to bring those cars out. So anything that's produced after the Second World War, we allow air conditioning to be fitted as long as it's in a workmanlike mm -hmm. manner. And we don't take any points for that. And that goes for overdrives in uh, pre-war mm -hmm. cars, oil filters, those kinds of things mm -hmm. we think make the car more usable and uh, make it last longer. We, we don't deduct for any yeah. of that. So when you say oil filters, for example, in my 20 horsepower, I could easily put in a full flow oil filter. And as long as it's done in a proper professional manner, that would be appropriate. What, what about changing to the uh, spin-on filters on an R-Type or something like that? Well, again, we, we don't uh, deduct for, for that, but I think in, in that case, certainly if it's a full flow type arrangement, I think a car, two cars exactly the same on the field, I think you would perhaps use that as a tiebreaker because um, the filter system on a full flow filter would, would be adequate. Okay. I know uh, another question some people have asked me before judging, and I, the answer I think is obvious, but does it really matter if every every one of the accessories in my car works, if the radio works, if the clock works, and I guess it's just worth make, making the point that the judges will be checking those and they will be expecting that almost all of those things are in, in proper working order, um, maybe with the exception of the windshield wipers because we don't tend to ask people to work the wipers on a, at least on a dry day. Yeah. Well, certainly, we, we would expect everything to work on the car, and the car would be judged on that level. Yes, you're right about the wipers. We don't run the wipers for fear of scratching the windshield or the washers, but uh, you could be asked to uh, do it. And certainly, if you were in for senior and it was a, a wet day, you would be expected <laughs> yeah. to turn them on. So certainly, you would uh, need to make sure they're working. Yeah. Well, talking about wet days, uh, another thing that comes up sometimes is the, uh, the top. Do you... Uh, do you have the top up on your car for judging? My understanding is always we, we judge cars with the top up. Um, That's correct. And uh, of course on an old car, we'll assume the mechanism works because it's pretty basic. What about say a corniche or something like that? Would you have to work it? Well, I know, I know from uh, experience that uh, corniches, they ask the owner to release the catches okay. and then run the motor to at least see that it, it does indeed work. But no, you're, you're absolutely right, the cars are judged with the tops up all the time. So if you are having a convertible judge, you would need to have the top up. Ralph, there are a lot of issues that come up on authenticity. Let's say a, a pre-war car with, with chrome-plated wire wheels, for example, or things like that. Uh, how should an owner deal with that? Well, it really goes back to the build sheet. I know for a fact that some pre-war cars did have chrome wire wheels, mm -hmm. but uh, generally speaking, they didn't. So it, it'll come down to the fact whether or not you're able to prove to the team that your car did have it. And yeah. um, all the time, if you have something different, strange, however you want to describe it on your car, you need to bring the build sheets with you. Because the way it's set up is it's your job to prove what was correct yeah. on your car, yeah. not ours. Yeah. And so, so the onus really is on the owner to, to show the judges if, if he's got something really unusual that it, it is in fact permitted and the, the only real way of doing that that I know of is the build sheets. That's correct, yeah. yes. Could yeah. you explain what the build sheet is? Uh... The build sheet is uh, when every car was being produced, certain, um, the car had a build sheet and what was done with that is what the owner ordered or the customer ordered and it was written down and kept on record as to, to, to what, is, what was put on the car, even to the point of the colour of the car 
the, uh, the veneer, I'm now talking post-war cars, because pre-war cars, generally it was coach builders, and there were some coach builders records, but they're very far and few between. But post-war cars certainly had a build sheet with all of those things, so it's, it's easy to, to find out what was there. But again, uh, we, I'll use the example of key numbers. Quite often somebody will lose a key and say, you know, what's my key number? They'll confound the club and sometimes they'll get the key number, sometimes they won't. But those, those build sheets are the, really the uh, history of the car. Can and very they be useful. obtained? Oh yes, sheets? certainly for, for your car you can call the club headquarters and they'll give you the information that Rolls-Royce gave to the club. So that's very useful. It brings to mind uh, a silver cloud that uh -huh. uh, we had, uh, that had no chrome strips along the side. And uh, of course everybody thought that somebody had taken them off because they weren't any good. But um, it's very important to bring your build sheets and uh, show what's, what's been changed on the car or what's different to what the regular production of the car is. Uh, Rolls-Royce will accept orders from people who have different tastes to perhaps their standard cars. Um, the particular car I'm talking about had locks on the hood inside the car and no chrome strips and all kinds of things. It even had a klaxon horn that was operated, foot-mounted switch that operated the klaxon horn and uh, you would really want to take all of the points off for these things but uh, with the build sheets it was shown to be the way the car was ordered. So cars really quite late and of course with the even more modern cars, people are, are encouraged to uh, um, order the cars the way they want them. So we, we in this, the Rolls-Royce Club, it isn't thousands of cars that are produced exactly the same. They all can be a little bit different. So, but you need to show the judges that your car is indeed correct if it, if it is different from the norm. And, and in fact, in some of the earlier cars, some of what's on the build sheet won't be there, but that's another story. Rolls change their minds sometimes, or customers change their minds halfway through. On the build sheets for my 20, it was ordered with two wheel brakes, but the car has four. And uh, if you look at the build sheets, eventually you find where the car was sent back to have them put on. And that happened yeah. through that period of time uh, mm -hmm. quite a bit, you know. Um, yeah. Cars, you know, in the early days, perhaps one chassis number didn't get something and the next chassis number did. So that makes it difficult for judges too because they think they know a model based on the car that they have. You know, they own this car so now they're an expert so they go out. So we all have to be very open-minded and be able to prove that uh, one car is different to the other and it's a learning experience. I mean, we're, we're in this hobby to learn about the cars, learn about the history and I think, you know, that, that is a good tool to learn. Well, one other authenticity question, Ralph, is, is wiring in, in cars, especially the older ones. Uh, they, were, they were supposed to have cloth wiring. Lots of them got restored years ago when that was difficult to obtain, if not impossible. How, how do we handle that? What, what's the appropriate way to deal with it? Well, as, as in all of the other issues, really it comes down to yeah. if everything works on the car and, and it, it's in keeping and it's, it's fitted properly, then, then it's not an issue, really, other than the fact that if it's, if it's a close, it's a good tiebreaker. Mm -hmm. It's something to do, um, yeah. something to, to break a tie and, okay. and bring the best car. So yeah. we, don't, we don't necessarily take the points, but it could be, it could be construed that way. Understood. And, and, and certainly if you're restoring a car now, you absolutely should use the, uh, the cloth wiring. It's available, and, right. uh, and it's the only safe way of doing the restoration from yeah. a judging standpoint. Right. Well, I'd like to know uh, in the touring class if I can trailer my car to the meet. No, in the touring class, in the post-war cars cannot be trailered to the meet. All of the cars have to be driven to the meet the whole way to the meet. In post-war car or pre-war cars, I should say, are allowed to be trailered to the meet but they have to do 100 miles when they get to the meet. We also allow, if you're part of a, uh, perhaps a ghost train or something that's going to meet up somewhere and drive partial way, partial way to the meet, we'll allow you to do that as long as you can prove that you've driven more than 100 miles. We can do that. If you trailer a concourse car to the meet, 
you are required to drive that car 100 miles. And what the requirement is, when you get to the meet, you find a member of the judging, the chief judge, and he will assign somebody to go and check your mileage. And over the period of the week of the meet, you have to do 100 miles before judging day so that the team captain will check your mileage, you'll be given, give, he will get your uh, trailering certificate, he'll check your mileage in and make sure your mileage is 100 miles more and then your car will be judged. But we do require that every car is driven 100 miles if it's trailered to the meet. Ralph, a lot of people are afraid to drive their cars to meets because they're, they think something's going to go wrong. I mean, how do we treat, say, some damage you pick up on the way? Someone dings your door in a parking lot. Do you lose points for that, or can you uh, get some dispensation? Well, if, if, if we feel that it's, it's worthy, if somebody drives to the field with a big dent in the door or something like that, we know that generally people aren't going to come to a meet mm -hmm. and have their car in concourse, and they've registered for concourse with a big ding. So we, we'd be as lenient as we can, and, and generally we hope that somebody can back up mm -hmm. your story, but normally we'll, we'll take your word for it if it seems provable. If there's a ding with a pile of rust yeah. at the bottom of the ding, obviously we're not going to believe it. I, that, that makes perfect sense. And, and I guess another variation, uh, you, uh, something goes wrong on the way mechanically and you end up having to buy a, a non-Rolls non Royce or non-authentic part to, to make it to the meet. Are we going to accept that? Or you, you've got the original part with you, it just doesn't work anymore. Well, it's kind of a difficult situation, mm -hmm. and it really comes down to the whoever's judging the car. Yeah. It's going to be his call, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you're going to take your chance with that yeah. one. Yeah, and you in fact, a lot of those things are actually available in the market at the meet. So, if it's something, you know, yeah. if I were judging and it was something the the, the owner could easily have fixed with a, a quick uh, Visa card payment at at the flea market, I'm perhaps not going to be quite as sympathetic. Oh, yeah, I'd agree with that, yeah. certainly. Okay. One, uh, one other question some people ask, and, and just to get our policy out, is I'm at the meet, but I don't really want to stand around the field all day. Can I have my uh, son show my car for me? Well, you can have your immediate family yeah. member show yeah. the car. We'll yeah. allow that, but we won't allow uh, restorers or people that uh, maybe work on your car. We won't, we won't do that. The, the meet is for the owners, for the owners to show their cars, so that's why that rule's in place. We don't want 10 cars to come with a restorer and him to show the cars. We, we want you to be there. We want you to be a part of it. I am planning on uh, driving my car to the meet, but I'm still not sure about whether I'm gonna enter my car in the meet. Well, you know, if, if you're asking yourself that question, I think you're, you're Part way there to actually entering the car, it sounds as if you, you'd really like to and you're just hesitating. And there's a lot of benefit, as, as we've been discussing, for doing it. You get the benefit of, of uh, assessing how you're doing with the car, and you make a real contribution by bringing the car and letting other, other members of the club <laughs> see it, because that's, that's really what the meets are about. People are there to see cars. They like to, if they've got a shadow, they want to know what their shadow should look like, and they want to see how yours stacks up and see what what they should be doing to theirs. So I think, I, I think you would benefit from the experience and club, other club members would benefit as well. So I'd do it. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. We yeah. uh, decided to drive out to the California coast yeah. to a meet many years ago. And uh, on the way out there, we had convinced ourselves we didn't need to go in for judging. It was a long drive. We were just gonna take it easy when we got there. When we got there, everybody was cleaning their cars and we got drawn in and in those days, there was no uh, time frame that you had to register the car early or anything like that, and there were shorter cars. So we, we went in for judging. So the three of us jumped on the car, cleaned it, and uh, we actually won an award. We did very well, we won an award. And we, we went into the drive-by. And the whole experience, I mean, it's an exciting experience. It is a drive-by. Well, the drive-by is at the, end, at the end of the meet. We have a banquet and the awards are made, and then the, if there's room at the hotel, you, you can have a drive-by and the cars are all lined up and all the, uh, pop, uh, all the members uh, sit around and watch all these beautiful cars go through. And they clap and it, it's, a, it's a great feeling. It's a, a real triumph, if you like. And it, it was a wonderful experience. And I, I say everybody should at least experience that once. It's very good. I'd like to thank you both for coming out this afternoon. 
Well, thanks, Ralph. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Ralph. It's been a pleasure. I'd like to thank you for joining us on the show. I look forward to seeing you and your car on the judging field. Mm -hmm.